simplest sense, a multiverse is another alternative universe that is at least beyond our cosmological horizon. But in its most complicated form, a multiverse could also be a universe that exists only in Hilbert space or a completely new mathematical construct that's just the ultimate un ensemble. Inflation is the superluminal expansion of the universe. It lasted from 10 to the minus 35 seconds to 10 to the minus 33 seconds after the Big Bang. And the doubling time for this expansion was 10 to the minus 27 seconds. And it basically explains the bang of the Big Bang, which is not attempted to be explained in any other theory in the standard model. But inflation is caused by a so-called negative gravity which is predicted by Grand Unified Theory. Now, when there is so much energy in the early universe, since the energy density is absolutely massive, things behave kind of differently, and gravity is turned on its head. And this allows for the superluminal expansion. Rather than gravity pulling everything together, it is pushing everything apart. And that is basically the bang. The interesting thing about inflation is that during the expansion periods, the energy density of the universe doesn't change. And that seems to contradict the conservation of energy. But you've got to remember that gravitational energy is a negative potential, and the energy of all the other stuff, like matter, and all the things that make up the universe, is positive energy. So, essentially, the overall energy of the universe cancels to zero. And now, an interesting byproduct of this is that you can get universes for free, which is kind of nice, really. So you can, the universes can pop up for absolutely cost nothing, energy terms. For many years, a major problem with inflationary theory was that it predicted the mass density of the universe to be 1. Now, this is a problem because the mass density of the universe can be any number at the point of the Big Bang. And if it's less than one, between zero and one, then it tends to zero exponentially. And if, it, if this number is greater than one, it tends to infinity exponentially. And the universe will be either open or closed. But the inflationary theory predicts that the universe is flat with this value of one. So why one? Well, inflationary theory predicts that because of this repulsive gravity, this actually has the opposite effect of driving the mass density from any number it likes to one over the inflationary period. And, well, inflationary theory is proved right because um, the astronomers have done their calculations now and it turns out the mass density of the universe is one, so we're right. A, a good analogy of space is this bowl of water. In a very small scale, you have fluctuations in this space, a bit like waves on the surface of the water. These represent quantum mechanical fluctuations. And at the moment, I, I, I stir it around and very little happens, because the water is essentially stable. Okay. Now, if I represent the inflationary field with this fairy, fairy liquid that breaks down the surface tension of the water, the water is now in a metastable state. And when I add our quantum fluctuations, the surface tension breaks down and you get bubbles occurring, like bubble verse, multiverses. So I, I keep stirring and you get more and more and more of these bubble verses occurring. Now if we take this analogy th further, the, the space between the bubbles has a potential to form another bubble. This is exactly like inflationary theory. As the bubbles separate, there's a, a potential that another bubble will form in between the two bubbles where the surface tension of the water breaks down. So you more quantum fluctuations the more bubble verses you get. Although inflation ends, 
when the matter that causes gravity to repel decays back into normal matter. On, this is a local phenomenon, and on wider scales, inflation is still happening exponentially, and this is known as eternal inflation. One of the problems with the standard model at the moment is that through experimental evidence we observe the universe to be in thermal equilibrium, a homogeneous. Now, if you propose a thought experiment to think of one point in the universe and another point separated by further than 13.7 billion years, light years, so that's further than the age of the universe. So light from this point, point A, to point B has not, has not had time to travel to point B and therefore these points are, are completely independent of each other. They could not reach thermal equilibrium even with the current rate of expansion of the universe, light still would not have time to reach these points at some earlier time. Now, inflationary theory gets around this problem by proposing the superluminal early expansion of the universe. So if the universe starts at a single point, where points A and point B are together, and then they are forced apart faster than the speed of light, once normal expansion of the universe is resumed, these points will come back in to our event horizon and be seen to be in thermal equilibrium. One of the problems with Grand Unified Theory is explained by inflation, and that is that the huge energy scales of Grand Unified Theory, magnetic monopoles form, and these have never been observed. So, any theory that solves this, that says you don't get magnetic monopoles, is a useful theory to have. Now, during the rapid expansion of inflation, these exotic particles, these magnetic monopoles, are forced so far apart that the probability of observing them anywhere near where we're trying to observe is near zero. So this essentially solves the problem. Okay, I'm going to have to admit I lied to you um, earlier about the universe being homogeneous because it is almost homogeneous. And the very nice thing about the universe is that it has galaxies and stars and planets which aren't all the same temperatures as everything else. Now inflation also explains this large scale structure and small scale structure of the universe. Because over the inflationary period, quantum mechanics continues as normal through space and these tiny quantum mechanical fluctuations are expanded exponentially many many times onto cosmological scales and create the large scale structure such as galaxies, groups and clusters. Now inflationary theory also helps create the multiverses that you're probably all more aware of and that is parallel universes. So that's the universes of Schrodinger's cat and other thought experiments. So, in inflationary theory, you're having bubble verses being, or pocket universes being created all the time. So if you think you have an infinite number of universes that have been created, and there are only so many particles in those universes, it is a fact of the ergodic hypothesis that you will be recreated as a perm new as permutation, you will be recreated identically in another universe. Uh, so that will essentially be a parallel you, somewhere else. And I mean, there'll be an infinite number of parallel yous in an infinite multiverse. So if you go down to quantum mechanical scales of the electron, which has spin up and spin down, you can now describe that electron as a superposition of all the quantum states and all the universes. In, in this case, you end up with Born rule. So you get normal quantum mechanics happening as expected with infinite universes. Inflation also explains string theory, as string theory needs a large number of string vacua, and inflation populates the universe with an infinite number of string vacua. 
This therefore populates the landscape of string theory. Inflation actually has a lot to say about nothing. Now that is what nothing is actually made out of. Because in any space, empty space, you have quantum fluctuations which actually mount up to a lot of energy. Now, scientists have calculated this, it's known as the cosmological constant. But unfortunately, it turns out that nothing is made out of a lot more nothing than you would expect. So, although this sounds strange, it's actually not got to, it's got too much nothing. You'd expect there to be a lot more energy in empty space than there actually is. It's actually, the cosmological constant is 10 to the 100 minus 20 in Planck units, and that's a lot lower than we expected. I'm going to prove to you now that to say the cosmological constant is too small is a stupid, is, is a stupid comment, okay? Here, I'm going to try and measure the temperature of the Earth. Okay, in this park, the temperature is 20 degrees, so therefore that is the temperature of planet Earth. Obviously that's a ridiculous assumption, because there are many different temperatures all over Earth. So we don't really, without going to many places on Earth and getting an average, we don't really know the average temperature on Earth. This is the same with the multiverse. With many multiverses, you cannot say that this is the cosmological constant just because it's the one you measure in our universe. We could live in quite a strange universe. In fact, we probably do live in a very strange universe where the cosmological constant is incredibly low, an incredibly small value. Now, we know if the cosmological constant isn't what we measure it to be now, the universe would be probably expanding far too fast and everything would be ripped apart, or it may be expanding too slowly and nothing would happen at all. So, the fact we measure it to be what it is, is because the conditions in our universe are just right for life to form, and therefore we are here to measure the cosmological constant that we measure. For inflationary theory, there is no explanation to why life forms and why the universe exists, apart from, well, that of God, simply creating the universe in the unique way to form life. But now with quantum mechanics, inflationary theory and string theory, we know that the sheer infinite number of inflationary universes created by inflation. One, but it's a statistical certainty that life will form in one of those universes. So really, this church should be devoted to the worship of statistics, or it should at least be a shrine to Alan Guth, the founder of inflationary theory.